Thank you, uh, Peter, for leading us this far. If you have your Bibles, please open to 2 Timothy, and we'll continue in our verse-by-verse exposition of this uh, letter. And we're looking at chapter 2. Chapter 2, and we'll commence, or chapter 3, sorry, and we'll commence at verse 1, and we'll be reading through to the end of verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of God, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Verse 6, For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with their sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janice and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janice and Zambris folly was also. May God add a blessing to his word. What we have here in this section is basically a warning passage of counsel. It's good to be warned, right? It reminds me of a smoke alarm. And just about every day there's some house that burns down Adelaide. And we hear whether the house was either fitted with a smoke alarm or whether it was not. And uh, I'm sure you'd appreciate if you were asleep at night and you were woken up by the smoke alarm and you rushed out and you saw a whole lot of smoke around and then you were able to get outside and escape. So this passage is a little bit like this. It's a smoke alarm warning us, warning believers, warning Christians, warning local churches. And so if you keep that in mind, we'll be able to uh, understand the context of this passage. But up until now, what we have done is we've spent some time in chapter 2 and of the, of the second letter, and we learned of the, of the discipline that every servant of the Lord is called to engage in so that we, because every believer is a servant of the Lord in some degree or other. And we looked at that chapter and we saw the disciplines that we are called to engage in so that we might be effective servants, effective bond servants of Jesus Christ. And so this has all been about Timothy, because this letter was written to Timothy, a pastor at the Ephesus, at the Church of Ephesus. But it's also written to every servant of the Lord down through history and even right to the very day. And so all of you who are saved, who are born again, who belong to Jesus Christ, whether you like it or not, you're a servant of the Lord. Now you can be a good servant or not a very good servant. You have to measure and gauge that for yourself. And so this has all been about Timothy and servants of the Lord needing to step up and to lay aside things like fears. And we know that Timothy had some of those fears, right? He was a little bit timid. And to laying aside desires, and as we looked at the other week, useful lusts, these kind of things disqualify any servant of the Lord in his employ. So they have to lay aside those. And so, so far, the emphasis has been focused on this kind of inward battle that we all have, this inward fight, this inward war, the battle that needs to be fought and won against our potentially wayward hearts. And dare I say, we all, including myself, have them. It's a battle. And so because of this, we learned that our hearts need to be cleansed. We saw this in verse 21 of chapter 2. Our hearts need to be cleansed in order to be useful for the master, to be vessels fit for every good work that he's prepared for us. And that's what the Lord has saved us for, right? 
He's not saved us to be sit here and stuck. He saved us so that we might be prepared for every good work that he has in store for us. So you're involved in the Lord's service. But in chapter 3, the focus of the battle for the God's servants shifts somewhat. Paul in chapter 3 shifts from the inward battle that we need to have in order to produce things like perseverance and faithfulness and diligence and and kindness and gentleness. All those kind of things are, are, are things that we need to discipline ourselves so that we'll produce that kind of mindset, that love and, and gentleness, etc. And so th- this battle has shifted to another battlefront. And this battlefront, can we say, is very much without. Not so much within, it's without. It's much broader a matter of fact, that it even engages and even involves the world and the culture around us. Because the world and the culture around us is bent on making inroads to the church itself. And even to this church. And as you know, we live in a fallen age, fallen day, a, a hostile environment hostile against God. And we know that this day is energized by Satan himself and he is all out to entrap and to mar the testimony of the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Timothy, as well as any servant of the Lord, needs to know the tactics used by Satan in his efforts just to do that, to mar the testimony of the saints, to mar the testimony of the gospel. And so this is our battlefront, folks. This is our, 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 our ongoing battleground. It's a battle with worldly concepts, with cultural norms. It's a battle against the worldly context that is going all out to an, invade the church. And might I say it does. And so as we think about that, you think, oh, wow, it's not that bad, is it? Well, yes, it is. And while I'm saying this, if any person who calls themselves a Christian finds the culture around them and the worldly concepts and all that's in it, all that it produces, if you find that comforting and pleasing and the place you like to be, let me give you a warning. Can I say to double check to see if you are in the really on the Lord's side at all? The Apostle James in chapter 4 verse 4 says, Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And that's a serious, serious statement. So how does Paul deal? Well, how does Paul in this passage continue to counsel Pastor Timothy and all of us who serve the Lord in this hostile environment? How does he do that? Well, firstly, he says why he wants to warn Timothy and his readers. He does with this, if you have a look at verse 1, he does this, but realize this. You see that? That's the first three words, but realize this. In other words, here is the shift in emphasis of Paul's counsel, his warning. He now wants Timothy to know that not only does he need to be a cleansed vessel, prepared for every good work that we mentioned, and he mentions back in 21 of chapter 2, not only does he want Timothy to be that, but he says, in the last days, difficult times will come. That's what he says. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Or put in another way, this is what Paul is saying to Timothy when he says that. Timothy, you, are, you not only have to be prepared inwardly, like I've instructed you in chapter 2, you also need to be prepared for what is happening outwardly in the world and in the church. So Paul warns Timothy and all of us in the last days difficult times will come now some get stuck on the word last days but let me just briefly explain what that means it's not a reference to some future time yet to come because Paul here is speaking to first century Christians right when he wrote this letter and so here he is using the term the last days the way it mo- is mostly used in the, in the Old and the New Testament. And it refers predominantly to the days after the coming of Messiah. 
So the last days is a term referring to the whole passage of time between the ascension of our Lord Jesus back to heaven and to his yet future bodily return in his second coming. That's the last days. And so Paul is speaking to Timothy about these last days because he wants Timothy and all believers to understand what? He wants them to understand the character of these days. You say, well, why does he want that? Simply because the character of these last days, it tells us a whole lot. It tells us a whole lot about the context in which we live and serve and minister for the Lord. And so in this section, we will see the kind of issues that Timothy and every servant of the Lord will be up against and that what we serve in. For example, in verses 1 to 5, we will see the context is one of difficulty and difficult people. Then in verses 6 and 7, we will see the need for spiritual discernment to win the battle against false teaching and its teachers. It's got what's going to be needed in those in these last days. And then verses 8 and 9, we will see that although the last days are fraught with difficulty and difficult people, and it's plagued with false teachers and their teaching, they will not prevail. Their folly will eventually be exposed. And of course, this is a great word of encouragement to Timothy, as he was plagued with false teachers at Ephesus. And I might say nothing has changed, right? And so this is a great word of encouragement to us as servants of the Lord. And so Paul is saying to Timothy in this whole passage that we have read, just let me run it through you in a contemporary format. Timothy, you are going to live and minister in difficult and dire days. Don't expect the going to be easy. Don't expect to see the world stay out of the church. Don't expect to see the church go unhindered by false teaching because it will happen. But more than that, Timothy, teach your people to be spiritually discerning so that they will know the truth from God's word against all that false stuff that will be in their faces at all times. And remember, Timothy, no matter how bad it looks or how persuasive false teaching can be and can get, the gates of hell will not prevail against the Lord's church. The false teachers will not have the final say. That's basically, in a nutshell, what Paul tells Timothy. My dear people, what Paul told Timothy, and through the inspired and scripturated words of Paul here that we have before us today, wasn't only for Timothy, but it's for us as well. And so let's look at this section in three parts for our counsel this morning, or can I say for our warning as well. Firstly, difficult times calls for definite action. We see this in the first five verses. You know, Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes are so real. There is nothing new under the sun. We can apply that to many things. We can certainly apply for it to these passages. Because what par- characterized the world in Paul and Timothy's day, the very same things characterize our world. And the big problem is it soon makes its mark in the church. That's the problem. How true it is, the sins of the culture, as I've often said, and I've borrowed this statement from someone, I haven't a clue who thought it up, but it was a good one. The sins of the culture soon become the sins of the church. And this is Paul's primary concern here as he warns Timothy. So as we look at this massive list of of 19 sinful descriptions, and we, we can conclude, yep, One after the other, 19 of them, we can conclude, yep, that's exactly what our world is like. Can I say, let's just not end it there with that kind of statement, because we need to understand is that the sins of the world that are listed here are not Paul's concern as he writes to Timothy. Because all those sort of things are going on in Timothy's time that are going on today. It was not Paul's concern as he writes to Timothy. That's the norm for the world. That's what we expect from the world. Because out in the world, that's the unsaved nature. That's the, the nature of the sinful nature of man is having its way. It's bent away from God. So that's the norm. 
You see, Paul's concern and our concern is to be how these very same things can brush off and become accepted in the church. That's his concern. How can that happen, that we might ask? How can that be? It happens shrewdly enough, subtly at times, when invasive world philosophies and false teaching via people who, who sometimes cunningly give just enough truth mixed with error and it deludes people who are not sound in doctrine and practice. This battle for the hearts of God's people abounded back in Paul's day and it still does today. So Paul tells us what we're to expect, what we're to prepare for in terms of the context of our life and ministry. He warns us that that life and the ministry is going to be tough. It's going to be, it's going to be hard and difficult, and we're called to do battle. We're, we're not called to just sit back and relax and take things easy. No way. In other words, Paul says to Timothy, you're at war, Timothy, and the war isn't against the sins of the world. It's these same sins that invade the church. It's being sneaked into your forever family, Timothy. The family of people just like this, whom you preach to Sunday after Sunday, has been sneaked in, and you need to be aware that this battle for their minds and souls is a reality. You see, in, diff- in the last days, difficult times will come. So then Paul gives this massive list of 19 description in verses 2 to 5 of what is normal and generally accepted in the world around him. But more importantly, it also characterizes false teachers themselves who Satan uses to offload these sinful characteristics into the church. Now, I'm not going to address each one of these, but only focus on some of them for our counsel and warning this morning. And the first one that I want to look at, because most of them, a lot of them are very self-explanatory. You don't need me to go, and you know what they mean. The first one is lovers of self. Now, folks, if there ever was a narcissistic age, if there was ever an age that was so absorbed with self and thinking that God and the world exist for our own personal benefits, it's ours today, right? We are so full of ourselves in this day and age. I saw, I mentioned to some of them the other week in my home group, I saw the epitome of this prideful self-centeredness on a, I think it was Today Tonight on TV, where this woman was promoting, some of you may have seen it, the idea that people need to learn to love themselves more. We need to learn to love ourselves more, according to her, before we even dare to love and to relate to others successfully. Evidently, she had some major problems in her life, all sorts of stuff, drug addiction and everything else. She went down a trail. And so she came out of it and sort of um, decided that she needed to love herself more. And so what she did is she spent a number of weeks or might even be longer completely isolated. and, And she gave that time to being purposefully obsessed with herself. And she indulged herself on how good and awesome that she was as a human being. And this was all done in order to love herself more so that she could be a better person and then relate to others better, supposedly. And she even went as far as to formalize this self-love and this love relationship that she had with herself by conducting a marriage ceremony for herself, to herself. Now, this may sound ridiculous, and we smile, right? And it is. But you know what? Behind this extreme, behind this extreme is the cultural push of prideful self-love, self-esteem, self-gratification, which is idolized big time in our world. And sadly, it is being pushed big time into the church. A bit of a dig here. Even our modern technology seductively sweeps so many of us into a form of self-love. And I said, what are you talking about? You know, once we took photos of family, 
of scenery, of other people. But now with technology, we can take selfies. It's obviously just another way that we can demonstrate how awesome and how we love ourselves, but we're not satisfied with that, so we post it out on the internet so everyone can see. We're self-obsessed. But more importantly... What we see here, as in Timothy's day, there was a lot of those who pushed this love of self as being part and parcel of the gospel. And then we see in our own day, the gospel is it's often twisted to become a message that there's all about us. It's all about me. It's all about you. It's become a self-obsessed message. It's become all about, the gospel has all about your joy and your peace and for your benefit and for your satisfaction and for your health and prosperity. That's what the gospel has become in so many of our so-called evangelical churches, dare I say. And might I say, coinciding with this false gospel, which it is, there is this huge decline, huge decline of biblical truth about the sinfulness of our sin, about the depravity of our nature, and about the wrath of God against sinners. Little is said of the hopeless state that we are in and the dire need of being rescued because that's what we need. Because all that stuff is considered too negative. And might I say again, least of all, little is said of the gospel being about God's glory, right? As we have in Ephesians chapter 1. The gospel has become merely about us. It's seen in the many songs that we sing today and the many sermons that are preached and all under the Christian gospel banner, might I say. Love for God first and foremost. That's the first command, right? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. That's the first command. That has been pushed aside and into the background and, and it gets lost in this lust and obsession for self-indulgence. And here Paul is warning Timothy and us that there will be those who proclaim the love of self in the churches. All folks, we see this today. Be warned. Be warned. The next description that we see, Paul highlights as being lovers of money. As you know and would expect, this doesn't need too much explanation that characterizes the cultures of, of Paul Day and, and it does today big time. The love of money, of wealth, the idea that money can give you ultimate satisfaction, it's rampant and almost part of our modern day psyche. We live in a day where, where materialism has so gripped us that, that we all, we're all tagged as consumers. And might I say consumers who always want more. And sadly, this idea of being an unsatisfied consumer has, has never been seen in the church like it has been in the last 20 years or so. You would have all heard of the prosperity gospel. This has been mentioned numbers of times. It's bandied about all over the place. And it's made huge inro inroads to the evangelical church, this prosperity gospel. You know, the largest congregations in the world are churches that promote and are committed to this health and wealth prosperity gospel. You might say, so what is this prosperity gospel? Explain it to me. The so-called prosperity gospel is a twisted form of biblical truth, a twisted form of Christianity that teaches this, that teaches obedience and giving and faith is a way of getting stuff from God. That's what it teaches. This false doctrine teaches that God doesn't want you to be ever unhealthy or ever unhappy or ever unwealthy. That's what it teaches. It teaches that if you can muster up enough faith, you'll have whatever you want. A recent survey in America showed that 46% of self-identifying Christians believe God will make them rich if they have enough faith. How sad that is. I don't believe we'd be too far behind, if not equal. 
Brian Houston, our great Aussie mega church pastor, I'll name him, I have no qualms about that, because Jesus names people, as we'll see soon. Brian Houston, he pushes this false gospel. He wrote a book called, dare I say it, this is the title, You Need More Money. How crass is that? And there are scores more like him and scores of books. You only have to go to Kurong to find the books. Folks, we know that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, as we have in 1 Timothy 16. And loving this stuff like there's no tomorrow is our cultural norm. But let us be warned, this seductive snare is also fast becoming accepted and even, dare I say, gospelized in the church. So let us beware. The last description I want to draw your attention to here is, or the next description I should say, um, is disobedient to parents. See, along with others in the list, it's interesting to see that Paul mentions this at the end of Romans chapter 1. Now, this may seem fairly trivial. What's the big deal about disobedient to parents, you know? Um, the big deal simply is this. Being disobedient to parents is plainly indicative of a larger rejection of proper spiritual authority. That's what, it, that's what the big deal is. And can I say our culture is plagued with a disrespect, a rebellion against parental authority, against lawful authority, and against civil authority. You name it. It seems to be in our culture's DNA to rebel and to reject and to, and to do whatever, but to be against it. But here's the big deal. If children reject the parental authority that God has given them for their spiritual well-being while living under their roof, those children will have no qualms whatsoever about rebelling against anyone else. That's the big deal. John MacArthur said in his commentary, it should be no surprise that a generation whose natural sinful self-love has been reinforced and justified by society is now undermining the family, the church, and the permissive society that has misguided it. So true. Should be no surprise. My wife often chided our children with this truism. Usually in a stern way and a warning. If you cannot obey your earthly parents, how on earth will you ever learn to obey your heavenly father? Quite true that, right? Be warned. Another description of what is rampant in the last days is, is people will be lovers of pleasure than, rather than lovers of God. And surely this statement describes the very culture we live in. But sadly, this very thing is also making its mark, like the others, in the church. So often many Christians and even churches, what they do is they, they mold God or they make God into their own image. In other words, they make God into someone whom they wanted to be rather than who God is according to the word of God. And so they form a God with their own minds, not from biblical truth. But too often it's a God who is all about giving them what they want. And so he becomes, in people's minds, a God who is the greatest means to bring them an even greater end. In other words, more wealth, more health, more personal satisfaction, more pleasure, more whatever. In other words, he's only a God of love and mercy and one who gives good things, and he's never about wrath and justice against sin. In other words, the end game this love of personal pleasure is not just something loved more than God. In other words, if it's a ratchet or two above. But it's what is loved rather than God. God is completely out of the picture and the whole thing. And that's what characterizes the world. And, and, and it's, that, that must never be so amongst us, folks. Never. Our love above all else is to be what? Is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Matthew 22. That's our first priority. 
Let us be warned. Anything that replaces our love for God is an idol. The love of pleasure and ease and prestige and comfort and status, it can soon become the Christian's idol. It can be loved rather than God. And that is dangerous. Next we see another description holding to the form of godliness, although they have denied the, its power, avoid such men. Building around us today, and we can clearly see a denial of the true power of God and his gospel as accurately describing our religious world today. They'll have a form of godliness, but when push comes to shove, they'll deny the power of God himself but what Paul does here is he cuts closer to home what I believe he's speaking of here is unregenerate people in the church who not only love themselves and money and pleasure but they also push false beliefs which corrupts the true gospel of the church they're professing Christians. They say they're Christians. But they're not. They're charlatans. In Paul's, Timothy's day in Ephesus, there were these men in the church and they were counterfeit ministers of God's grace. In other words, these people, they had a form of godliness. That is, they looked the part, they sounded the part, they had some truth. They may have been, and no doubt were, very intelligent people and well-read people, but they were impostors who were, who, were, who were bent on deceiving God's people. Well, Jesus recognized these kind of people in his day, remember? He named and shamed them, as I mentioned before. It says in Matthew 23, verse 27, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees! Now, if you wanted to see a religious person in Jesus' day, you went to the scribes and Pharisees. They were it. Before Paul was saved, he was a Pharisee. He was religious to the max. He had a form of godliness. But until he was saved, he denied the power of God. And so Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. He named and shamed them. Paul warned Titus, as Alex has taken us through some months back. Paul warned Titus in his letter to Titus, he says, of such men, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless of any good deed. Titus 1 verse 16. Folks, when push comes to shove with any of these false teachers or those who silently come in and profess to be believers but deny God's power, they will balk at the truth and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ alone. They deny the, that God's grace alone through faith alone and Jesus Christ alone according to God's word alone is the power that God uses to save repentant sinners. They deny that. They will always add something to it. And folks, as in Timothy's day, we in our day are oppressed with these charlatans. They're everywhere. These imposters who pretend to speak for God. So what are we to do? What are we to do? Here's the definite action. We're to avoid these men. We're to avoid them. We're, we're to avoid their teaching. We're to avoid the, the, their messages. In other words, we're not to give them the time of the day. The word avoid here, by the way, here means Make yourself turn away. In other words, take the decided and definite action of turning away from it and from them. Avoid them and keep on avoiding them. There's the whole idea. It's a continual action in this word. Praise God, our church has been protected from such men. But let me tell you, you need to be aware of the material that you read. of the internet sermons that you listen to. Because Satan will use whatever means he can to deceive God's people. 
Second point. Divisive teaching demands our spiritual discernment. We see this in verse 6 and 7. In these two verses, Paul's main point is to remind us of the importance of spiritual discernment in these last and difficult days. Now, he's not here, as you will pick up, being a male chauvinist, as some quickly eyeball this text, because here he speaks of weak women weighed down with sins. He's not against women here to bring his point home. After all, let me remind you, let me, how did he start this letter out? How did he start this epistle out? I'll tell you how. Timothy, I knew your grandmother. That's what he says. I knew your mother. I know that the faith that's in you was first in them. They were godly and wise and consecrated women. Paul had a heart and a love for godly women. This, is, this man loved godly, strong, biblical women. So Paul's not against women in this passage. I just want to count that out. You say, well, why mention them at all then if that's the case? It seems here that in this actual case that Paul was speaking of, there were particular women in the Ephesus church who were the favorite targets of false teachers. These women may well have been exposed, and no doubt were, to the gospel, and they could well have even expressed some faith in Jesus Christ. But because of their guilt, and perhaps because of a love of ongoing sin, they were spiritually weak, and that made them vulnerable. And these women were easy targets for false teachers. They were easy pickings. And as you think about that, professing Christians who want to continue in sin, you may know some of them. I know one or two. Many down through the years. Professing Christians who want to continue in sin and yet desperately want to be rid of the guilt that they feel because they know the way that they're traveling is wrong, but they desperately want to be rid of the guilt, but they want to keep on to their sin, will listen to anyone, including themselves, that's what says various impulses in the text, to justify their sinful lifestyle and their behavior. They'll do anything and listen to anyone. The result is, folks, men and women in this weak spiritual state can listen and learn all they like from these false teachers and their own false ideas, their own opinions, you know what happens? But they will never come to a knowledge of the truth. How sad is that? Never coming to a knowledge of the truth. This reminds us how we need to read and study and understand God's truth. We need to be always in attendance for sound preaching and the teaching of God's word. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Home group after home group after home group. We need more and more. We need to be involved in it day by day, personally. Why? Because the more you hear it and are taught by it, the more you are enabled to discern right from wrong between God's truth and anything that is counterfeit. Because if you're not in it, if you're not being taught by it, you're going to be sucked in by these impostors like these weak women were. Thirdly, deceptive teachers will never win. You see this in verse 8 and 9 in our closing point. And so just as some women were picked out to illustrate a point, here we see two individuals picked out to illustrate another point now we're not too sure even who Janice and Jambrice were or uh, uh, that Paul takes, takes off here uh, they could well have been as some have suggested uh, two of the magicians who who duplicated many of the miracles that that Moses performed in the power of God remember uh, the coming out of the of the Israel it could have been two of them. Anyway, the point that Paul is making is here, as these two guys, they opposed God's truth in Moses' day, these were also men, there were also men in the church of Ephesus who opposed God's truth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Janice and Brees, Jan Brees, they were rejected by God. God gave them over to, what can we say, a continually depraved mind. Now, you don't want to have a depraved mind. Depraved mind is hostile against God. It's, it's, it's away from God. And by the way, every single person here, including myself, all of us were born with depraved natures. That is, natures that are bent away from God, that, that are not bent toward doing good and pleasing God, are bent away from God. 
And it needs uh, the life-giving Spirit of God to come in and convict us of our sin so that we will believe and trust in Jesus Christ to have that old nature buried and done with. And we become new creatures in Christ. We are born again by God's grace. We're new creatures. That depravity is done away with. But here we see that God gave these guys over. In other words, they had the truth before them. They had it demonstrated before them, but they rejected, they rejected, they rejected. And you know what? There is a point where God will give them over to a depraved mind. He said, that's it. Forever and ever. That's a serious plight to be in, I might say. And a serious warning. It's a serious warning to all of us who may have heard the truth but never have, have, have got down on our knees, as it were, and, and bowed our hearts and heads before God and says, God, I am a sinner and I need your grace and mercy in my life to deal with all my sin and to forgive me of my sin because that's the only hope I ever have. If you haven't done that, you're still of a depraved heart, a depraved mind. And the serious thing is, now that you've heard it, maybe for the first time today, God is going to hold you accountable. And if you reject this, it may well be that God gives you over to a continually depraved mind, never to impress upon you God's grace again. That's a serious state to be in. And so that's what happened to these false teachers and those who, those who follow them. And so no wonder Paul urged the Corinthians, okay? He urged the Corinthians. What did he say to the Corinthians? Because some of them were acting in a real dodgy manner. And they were acting like as if they were the world. They were rebellious. They were disobeying God's word. And they were living selfishly. And, and they, were, they loved money and they loved wealth. All the things in here, some of the Corinthian professing believers were, were really into. And so Paul comes at the end of his letter in 1 Corinthians and he says... I want you to examine yourselves, test yourselves to see whether you are in the faith at all. As we look back on all this, Pastor Timothy and any servant of the Lord could very easily become discouraged, as you can imagine. Timothy and any servant of the Lord would say, the battle is too tough. It looks impossible. The enemy is never ending. It just, for 2,000 years, it's been flooding and flooding and flooding, and the church is being infected and infected and infected. Why should I bother? What difference can I make? Those are the kind of questions that someone asks, right? But the best news is this, folks. These people like Janice and Jambrice and any false teachers in our day, listen to this. They will never win you got that they are fighting a lost cause this is why Paul pens in verse 9 that they will not make further progress their folly will become obvious he insists that no matter what and who Satan uses to thwart the purposes of God and the gospel they will not win the war Jesus said what did he say I will build my church And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I believe in Jesus. Rather than my own, at times, discouraged thoughts and opinions. And so I'm lifted up by this. Keep fighting the battle. Keep going on. You see, no matter how hard and bad things look, the Lord's church will stand firm. We sung songs, a hymn of that, but all about that this morning. This is the whole point of the book of Revelation that Steve is taking through. It simply tells us, if you want to look at the big picture, Jesus Christ will reign supreme and his people win the battle in and through him. Jesus wins. Now that should encourage encourage every believer. Every believer, every one of us here are born again through the trials and difficulties and discouragements of life. We win in Christ. Amen. May we be encouraged to avoid false teaching, to discern what is God's truth and what is false, and to know that the Lord and his people win in the end. Shall we pray? Our gracious God, we thank you for this warning passage in the Scriptures. And Father, the words that you have preserved for thousands of years now, forcibly hit us because we know that these very things that were penned so long ago 
so rightly describe the days in which we live. Oh, Father, encourage us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for warning us. We thank you for telling us that these things will be so. They'll be difficult. And there will be t- false teachers and false ideologies and philosophies that will invade the church. But Lord, protect us from that, we pray. Make, may we be discerning. May we grow in the strength and the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Give us a heart for yourself and for your word, we pray. Whether we're parents and bringing up our families, we pray for them. Lord, help us in that to be the parents that we need to be and examples to our children. Whether we're grandparents or whatever facet we're in in life, we always have someone looking on and whom we're to be examples to. Lord, help us to be salt and light. It is so easy to become entrapped and ensnared and go with the flow. But Lord, help us to be different, different according to your word. So Father, with these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.